All right, welcome to another episode of Mike Reads. Tonight we'll be continuing in our series on Thomas Sowell's Discrimination and Disparities with the second part of Chapter 5 and the Acknowledgements, which should actually wrap us up with this book. So this will be our final read in Th- Thomas Sowell's Discrimination and Disparities. Going to be a little bit long, but like I said, I think that we should be able to get through this entire book. Um, so we are in, the, in Chapter 5, which is entitled Social Visions and Human Consequences. We'll be, start, we'll be starting off with the subsection, Solutions, which is in quotes. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get this book wrapped up. Solutions. No one who looks at the facts of life can look very far without encountering not only extreme disparities in, inco- in outcomes, but also the pervasive reality of luck. Some may think of luck in terms of being born rich or poor, black or white, or any number of other social distinctions. But luck extends far beyond such conventional social categories, right down to the individual level. No one can choose what kinds of parents to have, or whether to be the firstborn or the lastborn in a family, much less what kind of surrounding community, with what kind of culture to grow up in. Yet such wholly fortuitous factors, from the standpoint of the individual, can have a major influence on how one's life turns out. As already noted, a study of American prison inmates found that most were raised either by a single parent, 43%, or raised with neither parent present, 14%, should total 57%. It was pointed out elsewhere that those children who had a parent who was imprisoned ended up in prison themselves several times more often than members of the general population. Similarly, in Britain, a study found that 27% of prison inmates had been placed in protective child custody at some point while growing up. If we have no control over luck, and no control over the past, then it is all the more important that we concentrate on those things over which we can at least hope to have some influence, notably providing incentives affecting future behavior. Income is an obvious incentive, and, because it is an incentive affecting economic behavior at all levels, we cannot treat incomes as if they were just numbers that we can change to suit our wishes, without considering how that will change behavior and the economic consequences that follow from behavior. Such consequences of changed behavior affect the output on which the standard of living of a whole society depends. Nor are those economic consequences something that we can conjure up from our imaginations or deduce from our preconceptions. The hard facts of history can tell us something and current factual tests of our hypotheses can tell us more. The same is true of incentives affecting crime, including both law enforcement and punishment. Here, perhaps even more so than with economic issues and incentives, Utter ignorance of relevant facts seldom seem to, seems to inhibit sweeping and passionate conclusions. Many people who have never encountered the kinds of dangers inherent in law enforcement do not hesitate to say that excessive force was used against someone resisting arrest or even someone threatening the, pol- the police. People who have never fired a gun in their lives likewise do not hesitate to express shock and anger that so many Bullets were fired in an encounter with a criminal. Even when an overwhelming force of police arrive on a threatening scene, bringing the threat to a complete halt without using any force at all, critics often call that overreaction to the threat, which never reached dangerous levels. The possibility that it never reached dangerous levels precisely because of an overwhelming police presence never seems to occur to such critics. As regards punishment, a criminal's unhappy childhood cannot be changed, and whether the person has become and whether the person he has become can be changed is by no means a foregone conclusion. Nor are the dangers he represents to other people's safety, or their lives, dangers that can be banished by saying soothing words like rehabilitation or alternatives to incarceration. This is not simply a matter of our choices but of our inherent limitations. What we might choose to do if we were omniscient is no guide at all to the painfully limited choices we may have when we are very far from very far for, very far short of omniscience, 
and when negative, unintended consequences have become so common as to become a cliché. If and when rehabilitation gets beyond being a word and becomes a demonstrable fact that can be relied on in the future, then its benefits can be weighed against its costs like anything else. These costs include the inevitable figure, failures that go with any human endeavor, and the costs of such failures extend beyond economic resources to lives lost. As for good luck, that too is a part of the irrevocable past. But awareness of the role of luck might temper the arrogance of some who have been successful and temper the resentments of others who have been unsuccessful and who seek boogeymen to blame them for their condition, boogeymen who can be readily supplied by, politi by politicians, leaders, activists, and the media. Since there is nothing easier to find than sins among human beings, individuals can always be found who have said and done bad things, and can thus be more or less automatically blamed for the bad outcomes of others. Beyond that, there is always the fundamental fallacy that outcomes would be equal or comparable in the absence of malign actions against the less fortunate. Here, as, well, as elsewhere, the only times over which we can reasonably hope to have any influence are the present and the future. The most we can do with the past is to learn from it. Efforts can be made to reduce the number of people currently likely to have damaging childhoods, but the outcomes of such efforts depend not simply on how fervently we wish for better results, but on our knowledge, resources, and wisdom, none of which is available to un in unlimited supply, and deficiencies in which can lead not merely to failure but even to counterproductive outcomes, extending to major social disasters. At the societal level, the same severe and painful limitations apply when seeking to redress the wrongs of the past. Where the deaths of both of the victims, where the deaths of both the victims and the victimizers put them completely beyond our power, our frustration cannot justify making symbolic restitution among the living when the costs of such attempts around the world have been written in blood across the pages of history. After territorial irredentism has led nations to slaughter each other's people over the, over land that might have little or no value in itself simply because it once belonged in a different political jurisdiction, at a time beyond any living person's memory, what is to be expected from instilling the idea of social irredentism growing out of historic wrongs done to other people? Such wrongs abroad in times, such, such wrongs abound in times and places around the world, inflicted on and, perpetuated by, and perpetrated by people of every race, creed, and color. But what can any society today hope to gain by having newborn babies in that society enter the world as heirs to prepackaged grievances against other babies born into that same society on the same day? Individual Solutions Many people, recognizing that those less fortunate may not have had the same opportunities as themselves, have tended to be less demanding about the standards being applied especially as regards qualities not developed as well within the culture in which the less fortunate have grown up. A promising youngster with many good qualities and strong potentialities may not yet have acquired the habit of punctuality, for example. A generous inclination might be not to make a fuss over a chronic tendency of that youngster to arrive 10 or 15 minutes late. Perhaps a case can be made for modifying the tone or manner in which such a person is penalized for tardiness. But that is very different from saying that a lack of punctuality can be ignored, or penalized less, than with someone from a more fortunate culture, who has been trained from an early age to be on time. Once again, that is part of the past that we can do nothing about, while the future consequences of what we do in the present are our real responsibility. In view of the fact that the kinds of future endeavors to which a promising young person with many good qualities can aspire are likely to have multiple prerequisites, and that the absence of just one of those prerequisites can negate the presence of all the others, a decision to ignore a deficiency in one of those prerequisites may not be an act of kindness in terms of its effect on that youngster's future prospects. 
the higher a promising young person goes occupationally, the more high-level people are likely to be encountered in the future, people for whom time is money, and who cannot be kept waiting repeatedly without adverse consequences to that tardy young person's future. Similarly, loosening behavioral standards in general for a child who has grown up without any consistent structure of discipline, at home or in school, risks having whatever abilities or potentialities that child has been rendered futile in a sweeping range of future endeavors with multiple prerequisites that will be encountered in adulthood, if not before. Being understanding, or non-judgmental, toward a young person from a culturally limited background may seem humane, but it can be the kiss of death as far as that individual's future is concerned. Something as simple as whether or not one speaks standard English can open or close doors of opportunity, again, especially in higher levels of achievement in many fields. Yet there are educators who see an emphasis on standard English as needless cultural narrowness, if not racism. Linguistic scholar John McWhorter, for example, sprang to the defense of those in ghetto schools who want to use, quote, black English, end quote, in teaching black youngsters. Professor McWhorter contrasted, quote, the general American take on the matter, end quote, as one seeing blacks as using, quote, a lot of slang and bad grammar, end quote, with the way linguistic scholars judge languages. By the latter cr criterion, he depicts black English as being as much of a coherent language as French, Arabic, or Chinese, all of which have colloquial versions different from their formal versions. As for why many Americans look at black English in the negative way they do, McWhorter says, quote, certainly racism is a part of the answer, end quote, even if, quote, the racist element in all this vitriol, end quote, is not the whole story. Professor McWhorter sided with those educators who said that black English can be used in schools, quote, as an aid to imparting standard English to black kids, end quote. Like variations on other languages, he depicts black English as something that people speak, quote, in addition to, end quote, standard English, and it functions as a lingua franca, according to the subtitle of his book. This picture of youngsters in the ghetto as simply being bilingual differs differs painfully from the reality of their abysmal scores on tests of English. Far from being lingua franca, facilitating intergroup communication, as John McWhorter depicts it, black English is a barrier to communication with hundreds of millions of Americans, as well as a barrier to communication with half a billion people around the world who speak English. It is a devastating constriction of the future opportunities available to black youngsters themselves. Where are the books on mathematics, science, engineering, medicine, and innumerable other subjects that are written in black English? Professor McWhorter's defiant posture of defending fellow blacks in their way of talking contrasts painfully with the, so with the social reality of sacrificing the future of whole generations of young blacks. Language issues are not peculiar to blacks or to the United States. Such issues have polarized societies around the world, sometimes to the point of riots and terrorism, as in India, or even a decades-long civil war, as in Sri Lanka. Because languages in Western Europe developed written versions centuries earlier than the language of Eastern Europe, the range of written material in the Slavic languages was far more limited, in centuries past, than the range of written material in Western European languages. Thus, a Czech child in the Habsburg Empire during the early 19th century could be taught in his own native language only in elementary school. It was 1848 before there were high schools teaching in the Czech language. Prior to that time, a Czech youngster had to learn German in order to become educated above the elementary school level and thus be able to aspire to a wider range of occupational opportunities as an adult. None of this had anything to do with the linguistic characteristics of either the German language or the Czech language and everything to do with the inherent constraints of the time when the prerequisite written knowledge for some professions was available in German but not yet in Czech. Ironically, 
a Japanese-owned multinational company has decreed that English will be the sole language of the enterprise wherever the company's branches are located around the world. In other words, they recognize that English is the lingua franca of the international commerce, as is the language of international airline pilots communicating with airports around the world. In Singapore, with an overwhelmingly Asian population, not only are all school children required to learn English, the language of instruction in other subjects is conducted in English. In such cases, the choice of language is based on practical considerations for the welfare of people rather than on symbolic or ideological issues. Practical issues about social and economic realities seldom have anything to do with the kinds of things that preoccupy academic ling linguists. Group spokesmen, activists, or leaders may be preoccupied with language as badges of cultural identity, but cultures exist to serve human beings. Human beings do not exist to preserve cultures or to preserve a socially isolated constituency for the benefit of leaders. Government Government Solutions Solutions can be a society's biggest problem, and especially governmental solutions, because government is essentially a categorical institution on an incremental world. When many desirable things compete for a share of inherently limited resources, individuals making decisions for themselves can make individual incremental trade-offs, giving up a certain amount of X to get a certain amount of Y, and at some point putting a stop to that particular trade-off when they feel a need to conserve their, du their dwindling, dwindling supply of X and are approaching a more adequate supply of Y. Government decisions, however, tend to be categorical. Things are either legal or illegal, and people are either eligible or ineligible for benefits provided by government. Billionaires are legally eligible for government subsidies in agriculture, even if there is not enough money to provide adequate medical care in government hospitals for military veterans. Government employees are eligible for pensions that pay far more generously than comparable workers receive in the private sector, even when there is not enough money to repair and maintain the safety of crumbling infrastructure. Categorical decision-making also means that words can carry more weight than realities. Poverty means whatever government statisticians say it means, so that a scholar who had spent years studying economic conditions in Latin America could say, quote, the poverty line in the United States is the upper middle class in Mexico, end quote. But another scholar, taking words more literally, could lament that America's poor were, quote, having difficulty keeping food on the table, end quote. How people with difficulty keeping food on the table can be overweight, even more often than other Americans, is a mystery he did not explain. Words trumped realities. More important than the assessment of intellectuals are the institutional characteristics of government. As a categorical institution, government can deal with things that we categorically do, categorically do not want, such as murder, or, or which we categorically do want, such as protection from military attacks by foreign countries. But decisions and actions requiring more finely detailed knowledge for making nuanced and incre incremental judgments are often better handled by decision-making processes with more intimate knowledge and involvement, and especially more compelling feedback from the actual consequences of the decisions made. Given how prone all human beings are to mistakes, in all kinds of institutions, one of the most important characteristics of any decision-making process is its ability to recognize and correct its own mistakes. Businesses that do not recognize their own mistakes and change course in time can face bankruptcy, even when they have been very successful in the past. Individuals suffering from the painful consequences of their own bad decisions have often been forced to change course in order to avoid impending catastrophe and in many cases have ended up with greater personal fulfillment and insight going forward. Various governmental institutions, however, have major built-in barriers to changing course in response to feedback. For an elected official to admit to having made a mistaken decision, from which millions of voters are suffering, 
is to face the prospect of the end of a whole career in disgrace. Courts of law are bound by legal precedents, which cannot be reversed willy-nilly without disrupting the effectiveness of the whole framework of law. Housing Solutions Once government housing programs have been created to help low-income families, then any family that meets the government agency's arbitrary definition of low-income can receive benefits paid for, which, paid for with the taxpayer's money. In 2017, for example, families of four people each with a family income of $100,000 were classified as low-income families in San Francisco where housing costs are unusually high. Why a family's decision to live in expensive San Francisco should be subsidized by the taxpayers, including taxpayers with family incomes under $100,000, is a question that does not even arise in this context where words with arbitrary meanings and categorical consequences guide government decisions. The sorting and unsorting of neighborhoods either by the sorting and unsorting of neighborhoods by ethnicity or income is an example of something which can be done either by government programs or by private market processes, such as those which changed Harlem from a white middle class area of Manhattan into a black working class area in the early 20th century. But these different processes operate under different incentives and constraints, leading to very different end results. A demographic study of Harlem, as it existed in 1937, showed that the black population had expanded outward from its earlier beginnings at 135th Street and 7th Avenue in more or less con concentric circles, each circle dif differing in the proportion of blacks in that circle's total population, and differing also in the social composition of those particular black people from one circle to another. In short, these settlements were not random. People had sorted themselves out, as other people do in countries around the world. In this study of Harlem, much as in his earlier doctoral dissertation on the black community in Chicago, Professor E. Franklin Fraser found substantial differences in the socioeconomic circumstances in the different concentric circles radiating out from the initial black settlements in Harlem, as the total population of blacks in Harlem increased greatly during the mass migrations from the South. Blacks were 99% of the population in the innermost circle in 1930, and 88% of the population in the next circle, but only 6% in the outermost fifth circle. Within the black population, Professor Fraser pointed out that, quote, the tendency, pointed out the, quote, tendency on the part of family groups to move toward the periphery, periphery of the community, end quote. The proportion of children under the age of five in the population ranged from just under 4% in the innermost circle to just over 12% in the outermost circle. The proportion of families on welfare in the innermost zone was two and a half times the proportion in the outermost zone. What this meant, both in New York and Chicago, was that those blacks who were most acculturated to the social norms of the larger society led the expansion of the black community into adjoining white communities. There was resistance, even so, but the expansion did continue. By contrast, government programs in later years in that racially and socioeconomically unsorting neighborhoods had moved blacks from crime-ridden public housing projects into middle-class neighborhoods. Both black and white middle-class neighborhoods and both black and white middle-class neighborhoods and have encountered bitter opposition from pre-existing residents in both cases. It is not obvious how we can even define a solution in a situation where people in three different groups are each seeking to have a better life, when their ways of life clash, unless one arbitrarily assumes that some group's desires automatically override any other group's desires. In short, there are no real solutions in such situations, and the best we can reasonably hope for is a viable trade-off. What actually happens often are especially bitter complaints by middle-class blacks who have sacrificed economically, sometimes for years, in order to be able to afford to move their families away from the kinds of dysfunctional and dangerous ghetto neighbors 
whom the government now chooses to place in their midst in their new surroundings. But protests from pre-existing residents are often ignored, and those protesting depicted as unworthy people obstructing progress. The alternative is to admit to having imposed a mistaken policy with dire consequences, which could be politically fatal to the promoters of such policies. Educational Solutions A categorical institution like government cannot be expected to make the best incremental trade-offs. History suggests that government cannot do so, especially when operating within the confines of a social vision based on assumptions of sameness, or at least comparability, among people, when there is no such sameness or comparability even within an underclass minority community in the United States, much less between an underclass minority community and middle-class communities of either minority or majority population. What can be seen from history, however, is that when people sort themselves out, instead of having the government do so, they seem to get better results, not without strife, but with less strife than in times when government solutions abounded, and so did racial polarization. This was especially apparent during the years when mandatory busing of children, school children was imposed in order to get racial integration in schools for its supposed educational benefits, which largely failed to materialize. However, when low-income minority parents have had a choice of where to send their own children to school, the educational results have been demonstrably, and often dramatically, better in the more successful charter schools. But charter schools have never attracted the same crusading zeal as the bus, busing campaign, not even when children in ghetto charter schools score above the 90th percentile in math and English, while other children from the same neighborhoods in the regular public schools tr- score below the 10th percentile. Often these radically different educational outcomes have occurred in the very same building, housing both the local neighborhood public school and the local neighborhood charter schools serving the same population. Income and Wealth Redistribution Solutions If those who are more fortunate are the reason others are less fortunate, then such things as redistributing income or wealth may seem much more plausible as a solution than in a world where the accumulation of human capital is more fundamental than the accumulation of physical wealth, even though the latter can be measured statistically and confiscated politically. Physical wealth can be confiscated and redistributed in a variety of ways, but human capital cannot be, since it is inside the heads of other people. In many times and places, various prosperous peoples with much human capital have either fled persecution or have been expelled from the countries where they lived and in both cases forced to leave behind most of their physical wealth, therefore arriving destitute in some new country. This was the fate of many Jews expelled from Spain in the 15th century, many Huguenots fleeing France in the 17th century, and the fate of many Gujaratis expelled from Uganda and and Cubans fleeing communist Cuba in the 20th century, among many others in other countries around the world in other times. The fate of the Gujaratis and the Cuban refugees in the 20th century has been particularly well documented. Many Gujaratis arrived destitute in Britain, but eventually rose again to prosperity. Meanwhile, the Ugandan economy they left behind in collapse in the absence of, other, in the absence of others with the same human capital as the Gujaratis. Cuban refugees likewise rose from their initial poverty on arrival in the United States and, 40 years after after their arrival, the total revenue of Cuban-American businesses was much greater than the total revenue of the nation of Cuba. Something similar happened in the 17th century, when larger numbers of Huguenots fled religious persecution in France. They took with them skills They took with them skills that had contributed to France as having been a leading, if not the leading, economic nation in Europe. Those skills brought by the Huguenot refugees enabled other countries to produce goods they had previously bought from France and to compete with France in international markets. 
The French economy suffered many setbacks in the succeeding decades following the exodus of many Huguenots. Despite all the voluminous writings making an intellectual and moral case for a confiscation of income and wealth in the name of social justice, there has been remarkably little attention paid to the question of the extent to which this can actually be done in any comprehensive, long-run sense. In the short run, confiscation can be easily done, whether by governments or by mobs looting stores. Detroit has been a classic example of both, and of the long-run consequences. Nevertheless, killing the goose that lays the golden egg is a viable strategy from a purely political standpoint, provided the goose does not die before the next election. A two-decades-long career for one man as mayor of Detroit from 1974 to 1994 was made possible by policies which drove the most economically productive people out of Detroit, ensuring the mayor's consecutive re-election by the departure of those people most likely to vote against him. It also ensured the decline of Detroit. Nor was Detroit unique. Such a combination of political success, along with economic and social disaster, can be found in a number of American cities where one political party has stayed in power for decades through redistribution of policies which drove out people who had much human capital and left the city a hollow shell of its former self after those tax-paying and job-creating people were gone. Third world nations that have had major confiscations of tangible wealth, whether the capital of foreign investors, nationalization of industries, or domestic entrepreneurs, have suffered a similar fate for similar reasons. The Past and the Future Looking back at the past, there is much to inspire and much to appall. As for the future, All that we can be certain of is that it is coming, whether we are well-prepared or ill-prepared for it. Perhaps the most heartening things about the past are the innumerable examples of whole peoples who lagged far behind their contemporaries at a given time and yet, in later times, overtook them and moved to the forefront of human achievements. These would include Britons in the ancient world, when they were an illiterate tribal people, while the ancient Greeks and Romans were laying the intellectual and material foundation of Western civilization, and yet, more than a millennium later, it was the Britons who led the world into the Industrial Revolution and established an empire which included one-fourth of the land area in the world and one-fourth of all human beings on Earth. At various times and places, China and the Islamic world were more advanced than Europe and later fell behind, while Japan rose from poverty and backwardness in the middle of the 19th century to the forefront of economic and technological achievements in the 20th century. Jews, who had played little or no role in the revolutionary emergence of science and technology in the early modern era, later produced a wholly disproportionate share of all the scientists who won Nobel Prizes in the 20th century. Among the appalling things about the past, it is hard to know which was the worst, since there are all too many candidates from around the world for that designation. That something like the Holocaust could have happened after thousands of years of civilization and in one of the most advanced societies is almost as incomprehensible intellectually as it is devastating morally and in terms of showing what depths of depravity are possible in all human beings. It is a painful reminder of a description of civilization as, quote, a thin crust over a volcano, end quote. If longevity and universality are criteria, then slavery must be among the leading candidates for the most appalling of human institutions, for it existed in every inhabited continent for thousands of years as far back as the history of human species goes. Yet its full scope is often grossly underestimated today, when slavery is so often discussed as if it were confined to one race enslaving another race, when in fact slavery existed virtually wherever it was feasible for some human beings to enslave other human beings, including in many, if not most, cases people of their own race. 
Europeans enslaved other Europeans for centuries before Europeans brought the first African slaves, purchased from other Africans who had enslaved them, to the Western Hemisphere. Nor was it unknown for Europeans to be enslaved by non-Europeans. Just one example were the European slaves brought to the coast of North Africa by pirates. These European slaves were more numerous than the African slaves brought to the United States and to the American colonies from which it was formed. But the politicization of history has shrunk the public perception of slavery to whatever is most expedient for promoting politically correct agendas today. This is just one of many ways in which the agendas of the present distort our understanding of the past, forfeiting valuable lessons that a knowledge of the past could teach. At a minimum, the history of slavery should be a grim warning for all time against giving any human beings unbridled power over other human beings, regardless of how attractively that unbridled power might be packaged rhetorically today. Quote, In a history, a great volume is unrolled for our instruction, drawing the materials of future wisdom from past errors and infirmities of mankind, end quote, as Edmund Burke said, more than two centuries ago. But he warned that the past could also be a means of, quote, keeping alive or reviving dissensions and animosities, end quote. The past must be understood in its own context. It cannot be seen as if its context were just the context of the present, but with events simply taking place at an earlier time. That would be as great an error as failing to understand the implications of the fact that the past is irrevocable. Because human beings can make choices only among options actually available, events in the past can be understood and judged only within the inherent constraints of their particular times and places. Obvious as this all may seem, it is often forgotten. Nothing that Germans can do today will in any way mitigate the staggering evils of what Hitler did in the past. Nor can apologies in America today for slavery in the past have any meaning, which less do any good, much less do any good, for either blacks or whites today. What can it mean for A to apologize for what B did, even among contemporaries, much less across the vast chasm between the living and the dead? The only times over which we have any degree of influence at all are the present and the future both of which can be made worse by attempts at symbolic restitution among the living for what happened among the dead, who are far beyond our power to help or punish or avenge. Galling as these restrictive facts may be, that does not stop them from being facts beyond our control. Pretending to have powers that we do not, in fact, have risks creating needless evils in the present while claiming to deal with the evils of the past. Any serious consideration of the world as it is around us today must tell us that maintaining common decency, much less peace and harmony among living contemporaries, is a major challenge, both among nations and within nations. To admit that we can do nothing about what happened among the dead is not to give up the struggle for a better world, but to concentrate our efforts where they have at least some hope of making things better for the living. Okay, that concludes chapter 5. I'm just going to quickly read through this acknowledgments. Acknowledgments. Even a small book such as this, but one dealing with a vast subject, incurs innumerable debts to the works of others, too numerous to name. In addition to the many writings cited in the footnotes and endnotes, there have been many other writings and other sources of insights that provided a background of historical, geographic, and economic knowledge gleaned over the years, without which there would have been no basis for the particular research and analysis that enabled me to, quote, cross-examine the facts, end quote, as the great economist, as the great economist Alfred Marshall defined the goal of economic analysis. Closer to home, commentaries and critiques by my wife Mary and by my colleagues and friends Joseph Charney and Stephen Camarata have been very helpful and the whole enterprise would have been all but impossible, especially at my advanced age, without the dedicated work of my assistants of many years, Na Lu and Elizabeth Costa. 
The institutional support of the Hoover Institution and the Stanford University Libraries has also been indispensable. In the end, however, none of these can be held responsible for my conclusions or for any errors or shortcomings that may appear. For all these, I must take sole responsibility. Thomas Sowell, The Hoover Institution, Stanford University. All right, so that actually concludes Discrimination and Disparities by, by Thomas Sowell. It's from 2018. I will put a link to, um, uh, yeah, copyright 2018. I will put a link in this video's description to, the, uh, to where I bought this on Amazon so you can get a copy for yourself. Uh, thanks for sticking with it through me. Thank for, thanks for sticking through this with me, uh, especially over the parts that I struggled and stammered over. Um, so we'll be moving on to another book. I'm not quite sure what that's going to be right now. Honestly, I'm probably going to do an, an excerpt from F.A. Hayek's uh, The Road to Serfdom before we move on to our next book. But uh, until then, thanks for sticking around. It's been Mike, signing off. <laughs>